Good evening, everyone. I invite you to take a Bible and open to the 146th Psalm. Psalm 146 is where we're going to focus our attention for a few minutes this evening. We appreciate the presence of all who are here. I know there are other things that would normally be happening for each of us on a Thursday night, but you've taken the time to be here and to take part in the spiritual activities, and that speaks well of all who are present. It's an encouragement to us. I want to thank you for the invitation to be here. This meeting has been scheduled for quite some time, and we're glad to finally have it come to fruition. We had a beautiful day to travel today, and of course we wondered if traveling was even going to be possible, and I was texting with Stephen and Clint yesterday saying, what does it look like on the ground? All these news reports with this gasoline fiasco that's going on in this part of the country. And finally, as we were texting, Clint finally said, well, Rachel was able to buy some gas just a few minutes ago. And I thought, well, if Rachel can do it, <laughs> we're, we should be good to go. So we went ahead and came on and had no problems at all, thankfully. And we're thankful to be here with you all. And our theme for this series is under the heading of trusting God in troubled times. Appreciate our brother Elijah leading us in some songs. We've just been singing about trusting God, believing God, having confidence in our God. And that's going to tie in with some of the things that we want to study about tonight. It's so good to be with you all again. I think the last time we passed through here was back in October and met many of you and Look forward to getting acquainted with you more. Of course, it's good to be with the Deatons again. After having worked together for a number of years up in Kentucky, we get a little chance to work together for a few days down here. Good to see Stan and Carla with us tonight. And of course, always good to, to have the opportunity to be with the Deans. I appreciate them hosting us. As I've been able to bring, as was mentioned earlier, my lovely wife and children on this trip too. Look forward to our time together. As is always the case, if there are any questions about anything that is said, anything that we cover, or any other Bible questions that are raised, bring those to my attention and be glad to discuss anything with you related to God's Word. Do not put your trust in princes is the title of our lesson this evening. The Bible warns us, of course, against putting our trust in man. In Psalm 146, which we'll get to in a moment, we'll find a similar statement to what we have here in Psalm 118. And we've taken the title of our lesson from these kinds of statements that we see in Scripture. Notice in Psalm 118, in verses 8 and 9, the psalmist says it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Now, while we don't need to go through life constantly suspicious of others and viewing others with mistrust, we have to recognize that there's a difference between trusting someone and putting your trust in someone. And so while we trust people all the time, we do business with people, we have contracts, we engage in interactions all the time, we, we trust the word of others and those kinds of things. But what we're talking about here is putting your trust in someone. That's a different matter altogether. And the inspired psalmist cautions us against placing our trust and our confidence in human leaders in our time of need. Human leaders have their own motives. And there are numerous examples in Scripture that serve to show us that human leaders are driven by various motivations rather than always having the best interest of others at heart. You think about in Matthew chapter 2, we read about Herod the Great when the wise men came from the east, 
having seen the star and had come to worship the one who had been born king of the Jews. Well, what did Herod do? He wanted to find the child. Why? What was his motivation? Well, he said he wanted to worship him. When in reality, he was motivated out of selfish ambition and jealousy, and we know his true intentions were to try to murder the baby Jesus. Don't put your trust in someone like that. Then we have another member of that royal family, King Herod Antipas, of whom we read in Matthew chapter 14. You remember what happened with this Herod. John the baptizer had confronted him about having taken his <coughs> brother Philip's wife, said it was not lawful for him to have her. Well, he didn't appreciate that, and especially Herodias did not appreciate that. And so we read of this account in Matthew chapter 14, where John ended up being beheaded at the command of Herod Antipas. Why? Well, the text tells us there in Matthew 14 that even though he knew this was wrong, he wanted to save face in front of those who sat with him at the table. Right? You remember Herodias' daughter had danced and pleased him, and he said, I'll give you whatever you want up to half my kingdom. And she, at the prompting of her mother, demanded the head of John on a platter. So he gave in because of those who sat with him at the table. Well, how would you like that to be someone's motivation? God's prophet was mistreated and killed. Why? Because he wanted to save face before those who sat with him. And then we have, of course, the chief priests and Jewish leaders in Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 27. They were motivated by what? When they handed Jesus over to Pilate. Well, the Bible tells us there that even Pilate knew. In Matthew 27 and verse 18, he knew that because of envy, they had delivered him. That's why they wanted to get rid of Jesus. They were envious. That was their motivation as leaders of the people. And then we have Pilate himself. Later on in that chapter, in Matthew chapter 27, we read about how Pilate, instead of giving, instead of, instead of committing himself to being motivated by justice and truth and noble desires, he signs off on having Jesus put to death. Why? Well, Matthew tells us there in Matthew 27 and verse 24, he saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising. Well, if there's a tumult that rises on the governor's watch, if there's a riot that breaks out and that gets back to Caesar, he's not going to be governor for very long. And so it's self-interest that's the motivation here. When this tumult starts to rise, in Pilate's mind, the most simple way to take care of this is just to have Jesus put to death and we can go back to business as usual. That's the motivation here. By a leader. And then we have another member of the Herod family, King Herod Agrippa I in Acts chapter 12. You remember what happened on this occasion? He took James the Apostle, the brother of John, and had him put to death. And then he sees Peter also why? Well, he saw that it pleased the Jews when he put James to death, and so he decided to repeat the action with the Apostle Peter as well. He wanted to please those who were under his charge, even if pleasing them meant doing something horrible. And then we have another Roman governor, Felix, in Acts chapter 24. Felix when Paul was in Caesarea as a prisoner, Felix was the governor for the first portion of that time. And Paul reasoned with Felix, you recall. As far as we can tell, Felix never obeyed the gospel, even though he said he was going to wait for a convenient time. But we find that Felix was motivated by personal ambition when at the end of that chapter in Acts 24, it says he... When he was succeeded as governor by Festus, he left Paul bound. Why? It says he wanted to do the Jews a favor. It wasn't about what was right for Paul. It wasn't about what was right according to the law. It wasn't about truth and justice. He wanted to curry favor with some of these Jews. And so he left Paul in prison at that time. 
So these and many other Bible examples serve to show us that human leaders often have their own motives for what they do. And their motives very often, unfortunately and sadly, are not pure. And so the psalmist cautions us, as we've read in Psalm 118, to watch out. Don't put your confidence in princes, human leaders, those in positions of authority in our world. So with that in mind, where will you put your trust? Where will I put mine? Since we understand that human leaders are often driven by various aims and agendas and the decisions that they make, we need to be careful about placing our trust and our confidence in them. Now, under our current circumstances, over the past year or so, during this pandemic, various government officials, various human leaders are constantly making decisions that affect the lives of billions of people. They are constantly instructing us and advising us as to how we should handle this situation in our lives. They've enforced social distancing, they have shut down large portions of the economy. They have at times mandated that churches should cease meeting. All of this with the stated aim of stopping or at least slowing down the spread of this disease. Now, while their instructions should not be completely ignored, I'm not saying their advice should be totally discarded. We need to at the same time recognize the danger of placing our trust in princes, in human leaders, in men. Not only in these current circumstances, but in all circumstances. Now, I'd like for us to turn our attention to the passage that I mentioned earlier, Psalm 146. Because Psalm 146 discusses the importance of placing our trust in God rather than in these human leaders. So notice with me, Psalm 146, and we'll read all ten verses of the psalm, beginning in verse 1. The psalmist says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs. He returns to the earth, and that very day his plans perish. Happy is he, who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked, He turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. We want to notice here what the psalmist says concerning the importance of placing our trust in God rather than in man. You'll have to excuse me. I, whether you're aware or not, where we live up in the Louisville area is, how should I put this, bountiful when it comes to seasonal allergies. And the pollen started to attack me on Monday, and so I'm, I'm trying my best to not lose my voice here as we begin this Gospel meeting. That's never, never a good thing to have happen. So hopefully we won't have that happen. But as we get into our study here of Psalm 146, let's notice first of all, the psalmist tells us that God should be praised. 
That's where we begin in this psalm. As I read from the New King James Version here, the Lord must be the object of our devotion. The psalmist starts out saying, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. The true God of heaven is the object of our worship and our devotion. You recall what Jesus said in John chapter 4 along these lines in His conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. John 4 and verse 24, God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. God is the object of our worship. That belongs to no other. God has extended to us as His children the great privilege of being able to draw near to Him and of being able to offer our expressions of praise and adoration to Him. Nothing else deserves that. No one else deserves our worshipful praise besides our God. The Lord must be praised. And He must be praised at all times. You'll notice in what we've read already in Psalm 146 and verse 2, the psalmist says, While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. And I want you to notice here that he does not say, When I feel like it, I'll praise the Lord. He does not say, when the Lord gives me everything I want and everything in my life is just working out and going the way that I want it to, then I will praise the Lord. You know, I don't know if you found this to be true or not, but when everything is going well and it's sunny and the skies are blue and everything's going my way, it's pretty easy to be thankful and to praise God on those days. But you know when it gets more difficult is when the dark clouds settle in. Right? The trials of life hit. Maybe the aches and the pains, maybe sickness, maybe some kind of financial setback, whatever it may be. How about being thankful and praising God then? The psalmist, instead of saying, I'm going to praise God, only when I feel like it or when He gives me everything that I want. The psalmist points out that it is right to praise God at all times while we live in this world. And it is always right to sing praises to Him as long as we have our being. As long as we are alive. And here's what we need to think about. God is still there even during the difficult and challenging times in our lives. Even when things are not going right. Even when everything seems upside down and wrong. God is still there. He is still watching over us. And yes, He is still blessing us. Even during those times. God is reigning over all. He is on His throne even when the trials of life come, even when the situation in our lives looks bleak and uncertain, God is on His throne even at those times, even on those dark days. Yes, He still reigns. And God deserves our praise at all times and under all circumstances of our lives. Never forget, never forget that God should be praised. Now, having begun with that point, let's move on and notice the second thing that we need to think about when it comes to placing our trust in God rather than in man, rather than in princes, is that man cannot deliver, can't deliver us. Earthly leaders, no matter how great and powerful they may appear, no matter the extent of their rule and their authority, 
earthly leaders are not our salvation. As we continue in Psalm 146, notice in verse 3, in contrast to the God of heaven, when it comes to earthly leaders, the psalmist says, do not put your trust in princes, nor in the son of man in whom there is no help. When the challenges and trials arise in our lives, that's when we're faced with a very real decision that we have to make. When things get tough, when times are hard, when things are not going our way, it's decision time. Where we put our trust in God, in spite of whatever's going on, or will we turn to man and put our trust in man? Human leaders and rulers often claim to have the answers to our problems, don't they? I mean, that's, that's how they get elected. Right? They've got all the answers, all the solutions to our problems. And they assure us that we need to look to them. We need to trust them for those solutions. And in our desperate time of need, when things aren't going our way, when times are challenging and difficult and the trials arrive, we may feel like that these human leaders are our only hope for things to get better. So let me tell you something. That is never, never the case. Since this coronavirus pandemic began, our governing leaders and their appointed experts have held press conferences from the beginning. They've made statements in order to inform us about how they're handling the situation, to instruct us about how we should respond in our everyday lives, how we should view the problem, how we should live, how we should act and behave. And they continually have assured us that if we'll just heed their advice, we will be saved from this terrible scourge that is on our land. Now, while they may be intelligent, they may be capable. They may have numerous credentials behind their names that I don't have and you don't have. Let me tell you, all these human leaders share one common flaw. You know what that is? They are human beings. That's what they are. And while we appreciate their helpful advice when it comes to how we ought to wash our hands and practice good hygiene and how we shouldn't cough and sneeze all over each other, we also need to recognize that these people cannot deliver us. They are not our salvation. Don't put your trust in princes nor in the Son of Man in whom there is no help. The prophet Jeremiah, notice Jeremiah chapter 17. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the people of Judah and he put it this way. In Jeremiah 17 and verse 5, he says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Well, well can, I, can I have both? I mean, yeah, I trust in God, but can I also, can I also put my trust in, in man at the same time and in some of these leaders and rulers? I mean, I still trust in God. What does Jeremiah describe here? He describes a choice that you've got. Right? It's one or the other. You're either putting your trust in God or you're putting your trust in man. If you're putting your trust in man, what are you doing? Your heart is departing from the Lord. We need to think about that. When we're faced with challenging circumstances, there is always the danger that we will place our trust in human leaders, people, human beings, mere men who cannot truly help, they cannot deliver, they can never really save. You see, these earthly leaders are limited. They are limited. 
Notice what the psalmist says going back to our Psalm 146 in verses 3 and 4. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there's no help. Then what does he say in verse 4? His spirit departs. He returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. What is the psalmist saying to us about these rulers, these princes, these human leaders here? Well, what he's saying, in other words, is that this human leader, this prince, at the end of the day, what is he? He's just a man. That's all he is. He's limited. Not only is he able to keep anyone else from dying, but he's also able, unable to deliver himself from physical death. He can't even do that. He can't prevent himself from dying and returning to the earth. How is he going to help you and everyone else if he can't do that? He doesn't know the future. He's incapable of seeing to it that his plans will be carried out and fulfilled and that they'll be successful. When he perishes, his plans perish. He can't see to it that these things are going to be carried out indefinitely. He's not capable of doing that. He's just a man. He can't save anyone's earthly life. And he certainly can't provide anyone with eternal life. Now notice with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 6. In Paul's first letter to Corinth, he highlighted the limitations of human leaders here in this way. Notice what he says, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 6. He says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. Now what, what Paul says about the rulers, the human rulers of his day, I'll suggest to you that it very much applies to the human rulers of our day. They are coming to nothing. As great and as powerful as these earthly rulers and leaders may seem to be for a time, they are severely limited. Don't place your trust in mere human beings who are going to amount to nothing in the end. These people who don't put their trust in God these people who don't surrender their lives to the King of Kings, these people who refuse to take their direction from heaven and set themselves up as the final authority, as the ones who know it all, as the ones who can solve all the problems, what ends up happening to them? They come to nothing. They come to nothing. Don't put your trust in those who are going to come to nothing. Don't put your trust in princes because princes cannot deliver. Now, as we think about putting our trust in God rather than in man, let's understand something else. And that is that true happiness belongs to those who trust in the Lord. As we continue here in Psalm 146, we find that our Creator our God provides hope. Psalm 146, after pointing out the limitations of the human princes, the psalmist now turns his attention back to the Lord. And he says here, picking up in verse 5, Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. When you place your trust in man, what does that do for you? Well, you live with anxiety. When you place your trust in man, you live with constant fear. You live with worry. You live with trepidation because 
He goes, why? Well, because you're counting on someone, you're depending on someone who can't provide you with the hope and the deliverance and the salvation that you need. That's why you have all of those things when you put your trust in man. But when you place your trust in the God who created the world and all that is in it, then do you know what you have? You have hope. You have confidence. In Titus chapter 3, the Apostle Paul wrote of God's plan to save us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And in the midst of that discussion, he says in Titus 3 and verse 7, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's what this is all about. God can provide that. No man can ever provide anything close to that. And we're going to talk more specifically at length about our hope on Sunday morning. But for the moment, let's think about the importance of this hope of eternal life. While the world panics, and while the world constantly cries out to earthly leaders for help and deliverance during difficult times, faithful followers of Christ can live with the calm assurance and the expectation of eternal life. What's going to happen here in this world? I don't know. Are things going to get better? Are things going to get worse? I can't tell you. Is it going to get really, really bad? Maybe. But you know what? As a child of God, it's not all about the way things are going to go here and now in this world. It's about having something to look forward to the confident expectation that we're going to have a home with God beyond this brief earthly life. Even when our physical health and well-being are threatened, we can be people, people like what Paul describes in Romans chapter 12. What are we supposed to be like? Romans 12 and verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Even when things are bad, even in the tribulation, we are to be people who are rejoicing in hope. We've got something that nothing and no one can take from us. For God never promised us heaven on earth. He didn't promise us that. But He has promised us heaven with Him for those who place their trust in Him and obey the Gospel of His Son. True happiness, true happiness belongs to those who have hope beyond this earthly life. And our Creator, our God, provides the help that we need. Going back again to the end of Psalm 146, the last three verses now of the psalm, he goes on to praise the power of the Lord. Notice what the psalmist says in verses 8-10. through 10. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked, He turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. When disaster and difficulty strike, you know what happens? Even the most powerful human princes are often shown to be powerless. But the God who created the world, He's still in control of the world. As the psalmist says in verse 10, He still reigns. He still reigns. And you think about what we've seen in the past year as the tragic impact of this pandemic hit New York City. You might recall how bad that got, how tragic that has been. I'll tell you something that's even more tragic 
than what happened there. And that is the words of the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, the press conference that he gave last April, where he boasted of how the number of cases of COVID seemed to be leveling off. And a news report on his press conference quotes the governor as saying this, the number is down because we brought the number down. God did not do that. Faith did not do that. Destiny did not do that. That's what he said back on April 13th of 2020. Let me see. Let me tell you, when a man talks like that, that's the guy you don't want to be standing too close to. But, you know, as they also say, that didn't age too well, did it? That didn't age too well. And we saw those numbers go back up. We saw that bounce around. And now we've lived long enough to see Andrew Cuomo on the hot seat as sordid details of his own history have come out. And he's been under fire in the past several months and has been clinging by the skin of his teeth to his job as a result. You see, the sad thing is that man thinks he can exercise some level of control in bringing blessings and prosperity to the world. That that's, that's under his authority. That's under his control. And it's just not, it's not just the governor of New York that we see this from. This is, a, this is a common problem from the most mighty and powerful right down to just the average individual. Man thinks that he can control his destiny. And what's happening and the prosperity and the blessings and the good things that are taking place and overcoming the bad things that are happening. You know what the truth of the matter is? Man doesn't have control over that. Every blessing comes from God. Don't ever forget it. James, James chapter 1 and verse 17. Does every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Our God who reigns forever, our God who is the same, our God who changes not, that's where the blessings come from. That's where the prosperity comes from. That's where the good and perfect gifts come from. Man doesn't control them. Even in difficult circumstances, as followers of Christ, we can live with the peace and with the happiness of knowing that God will provide for His children here, yes, here and now, but hereafter, hereafter, where it really matters, we know that God will provide. True happiness belongs to those who trust in God rather than in princes. Think about it tonight. Don't put your trust in princes. It's God who should be praised, not man. Man can't deliver. Man's limited. Man can't even fulfill his own plans with any degree of certainty. The true joy, the happiness, belongs to those who will put their trust in the Lord. Don't put your trust in princes. Now while we may appreciate those leaders who are trying to be helpful, while we appreciate those who show their motives to be pure, that they really do have the best interest of others at heart, while we do appreciate helpful experts who offer their advice, we need to understand that earthly leaders, every one of them, they are all severely limited. And they may or may not have our best interest in heart. If you want to have true peace, if you want to have true happiness, even in troublesome times, well, there's only one way to have that. We sang about it earlier, didn't we? You have trust and obey the Lord. That's how you can have that. Human princes will rise and fall. They'll come and go. But the Lord reigns forever. And He alone can deliver us 
in our time of need. He alone can provide real hope for the future. That hope belongs to those who obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to take your songbook and open to number 644, we're going to sing this song as a song of encouragement and invitation in just a moment. The song is Zion's Call. That's what we're talking about. The call to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as we bring our lesson to a close, we want to make sure that we do so while offering and extending that invitation for any who are not right with God to take the necessary steps in order to be right with Him. Have you been baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins? That's what the Bible teaches must be done in order for a sinner to be saved. If you haven't done that, you need to place your trust in the Lord tonight. Turn from your sins. Confess your faith in Jesus. And you can be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. You can leave here tonight having put your trust in God, knowing that you are placing your confidence and the God who will have you in His dwelling place for eternity. If you've already done that, if you've already become a Christian, but your trust in God has wavered, maybe that's come out in various ways in your life, maybe that trust that has wavered has resulted in you getting involved in some sin that needs to be corrected, Maybe your life has gone in a different direction than what the Bible prescribes for one who's supposed to be a follower of Jesus. If we need to make those corrections, let's come back to the Lord tonight and make those corrections on His terms so that we can have the forgiveness and the salvation that He offers. If we can help you with those spiritual needs, we invite you now to come down to the front while we stand and while we sit.